Welcome to Video Church. Tonight we're looking in the book of Joshua, but this morning we talked a lot about the very chapter we're going to read, but we want to think about, because this is a special service, something more than just what we're reading and something more than just what we're doing. We want to talk direct. We want to be clear about what we're saying. In Video Church, we were started by the whole idea that you could know Jesus in a personal way. Now, that doesn't sound like much of a shock today, but in my day, when I first got saved, it was revolutionary. People had gone to church, and the church itself, the denominations and the assemblies and quite a few of the churches, weren't teaching you could know Jesus. They were teaching that God was far off and that you had to approach him from a distance because of your sin. We weren't taught grace. As a matter of fact, in those days, it was pretty much about, frankly, having this long distance communication and some kind of relationship through circumstance. And so the whole idea of knowing Jesus personally was far off and far away until the Jesus movement came along. And once it did, it caught on among the young people because we were looking for something more than what society was telling us. We didn't understand how people could subject themselves to a government and have the government run their life, kind of like how the same thing is happening today. Well, in our day, we dropped out. We didn't try to change the system. We knew it couldn't be changed. And for you, if you're trying to change the system, it can't be changed. It is a government, and a government such as it is, is what it is. We know that according to Proverbs, it's going to remain the same. There will be good and there will be bad. And God will cause the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the wicked and the good. So you can pray for the government, you can get involved in the government, but according to these latter days, the government is going to be leaderless. It's going to be accomplishing the purpose for which God said in his word, it would be miry clay. It would have no form or strength of itself that it would be a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and directed by the people. And unfortunately, God doesn't see that as a compliment. He sees that as an insult to him. So, I don't know what to tell you about democracy as far as God is concerned, because God's not in democracy. <laughs> He's in theocracy. And, you know, you can go along with what you think is a good idea in America, you know, when you get into Christian politics, but God doesn't put you in Christian politics. You do. You choose to get involved in that because you think that is part of a world perspective, and it's not. You think that is part of something that the Lord has told you to do, and it's not. God has never said to get involved in politics anywhere within scriptures. Matter of fact, he anointed people for their offices. And when he anoints them, he appoints them. And whom he appoints, he anoints. And when he does that, that means he gives the ability for them to do that. So. I don't know what you're going to tell me once I tell you this and you share this with someone that may be in politics, but I'll say this to you, just like we're going to read in Joshua. You tell me that Jesus spoke to you direct and told you to get involved in politics and I'll say, God bless you, go and be at peace and let the Lord in you figure out whether or not he wanted you in politics. Because you see, it's interesting that these latter days, people would be into politics as opposed to in the gospel. Because they're not really sharing the gospel in politics. Although they say, well, you know, I'm a living witness. I choose to do my religious thing in politics. Well, that's kind of what they were saying back when sharing Jesus personally was such a novel idea. And today, I seem to be one of those people that, unfortunately, now I'm kind of looking at being called novel or retro. One of the two, you're not sure which. Because in my day in the Jesus movement, we knew people that said they heard Jesus speak. And we knew that they heard Jesus speak because they taught us as though Jesus spoke to them. And having been in that environment, I'm shocked to hear people say, well, God speaks through his word. Well, God can use the word, but God speaks, period. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they will not follow the voice of another. So I find it interesting that in these latter days, people are changing history of what was 
to what they want it to be. And that's what you see in politics. So I don't know what to tell you about kind of where we're going with this except to say that in Joshua 24 you're going to find some real challenging statements. You're going to find some real interesting words that God said and the people heard. And I can't explain that away. I can't compromise or lie to you and say, I don't hear God speak. I can't invent some way of saying, no, God is not real. We only go by circumstance or kismet. We only go by faith. We only go by substance of something that we put our faith into in a religious system of organization of a complete dogma and doctrine that we've organized and compiled into some kind of, you know, we've got to sort it out, figure it out, and intellectually apply it so that we can call it a philosophy of religion as opposed to an actual religious application of a relationship that's interactive with God participating in it. Because that's the reality of where we're at tonight. Is God real in your life? Are you participating with God and is God participating with you? Because I don't know what you are doing, but I know what the scripture tells me that many are called, but few are chosen. So I want to address you, the few. I want to speak to you that may be called and may be chosen, but I really want to address the few because, quite frankly, when it comes to the parable of the ten virgins, you know, there were five wise and there were five foolish, but they were all looking for the Lord's return. But the five wise didn't go and say, hey, you know, here, take my Holy Spirit. You know, I've got extra, you know. I want you to be a part of my life, you know, because you're so wise and so smart that you're telling me that God doesn't speak. Yeah, okay. You few who are chosen, I want to address to you the word of the Lord that God has given us tonight in Joshua 24. Because looking at this new year from this past year, there's many distractions that are coming your way. There's many abstracts that are coming in the religious world that are going to try to cause you to be involved in religion as opposed to involved with religion, a relationship you should have with the Father and with the Son. Because if you don't have a relationship with the Son, you have no relationship with the Father. You cannot have a relationship with God the Father unless you have a relationship with the Son. And we're told that a definition of what eternal life is, is that they should know me and know him who sent me. That's a definition. Interesting way of putting it, isn't it? And that's what Jesus said that they should know me and know him who sent me. It's not a description of eternal life. It's a definition of eternal life, knowing Jesus. Now, Jesus, when you appear before him, said something interesting too, because you're going to appear before him. Everything has been committed into the Son's hands, including judgment, including your salvation, your sanctification. Everything that's involving you has been committed unto Jesus, according to Colossians. You can read the book and figure it out for yourself. You can find it probably in Colossians chapter 1. Very quickly it mentions that. Everything's committed unto the Son. The Son gets to decide everything. So when Jesus gave the parable of those sheep and goats that were coming to him, it wasn't about nations. It's about you and me. Hey, baby, you know, if you're out there chewing on everything and eating everything, you're a goat. You know, if you're not feeding on the Word of God, you know, and you're taking in all of this television and football and basketball and sports and doing all these other things, fantasy football games, and, you know, playing this kind of game about three feet in the world and only one foot in God, you know, and you kind of dip your toe in there once in a while to see what it's like, and if the water's hot, ooh, I'm not getting in there until it cools down. Woe unto you, because you're going into great tribulation. Let me be the first to let you know, beyond any shadow of a doubt, you don't have to have any question in your mind of if you're going in the rapture. You're not. Because of the virgins that were wise, five, only half went. And that was of ten that were looking. So if you've compromised yourself by getting involved in all these other things, I'm sorry. You may be conformed to the world and you may need to look at the book of Revelation again and decide for yourself what church you really are in. Because in the book of Revelation is the first self-examination that you can use in order to determine where you're going to spend the rest of eternity. Because if you're a Christian, you'll probably be saved. I'm not telling you you are saved because, hey, I know lots of cults that call themselves Christian. And they are cults, legitimate cults, guaranteed, 100%, without a shadow of a doubt. Now, those people in the cult, K 
can they be saved? Well, of course. Could there be people in those cults that are saved? Well, of course. I personally believe that in the large denomination that calls itself Christian, that is a cult, the Mormon Church, there are lots of people that are saved in it. I have no problem with that. I don't doubt that they don't know that they're saved, but that God knows whose his are, and that he chooses to save according to his mercy and grace. That they understand what the gospel of salvation is, so the fact that they've added on all these other things, in my personal opinion, means that the entire Mormon church is going smack dab into the Great Tribulation period, on purpose, because they want to, they plan to, they've organized themselves to go to the Great Tribulation. They're supposed to save up all this food sources. They're supposed to save up all this money, all this planning, all this water, and all these other things to go into Great Tribulation. And I think, how sad to make a false realization that suddenly in the middle of the Tribulation period, well, you made a mistake. Maybe Jesus was taking some to be his bride. Because he doesn't take all. Many are called, but few are chosen. When you sit down and you examine this last year, I'd like to know for yourself and for myself, in a way, I don't really care one way or another, because frankly, God will save you if he's going to save you, and he's not if he's not. I pray for your salvation. I hope you make it. I pray that you choose this day whom you will serve, but that's in the message. What I want to know from you is, when you look back over the year, what did you spend the most time at? What did you really involve yourself mostly in? Did you use your grace to go do your own place of business? I mean, you spend eight hours a day at your job. Do you ever think of God or talk to God during your job? You spend a lot of time working for getting what you got from God because it wasn't your job that gave it to you. It wasn't your income that gave it to you. It wasn't your provision of some type of employment that gave you what you own. Because the fact of the matter is, when God calls you on the carpet, he's going to say, I provided. And you can tell him if you want to, well, Lord, I worked it. No, you didn't. As a matter of fact, God provided for you. You just got involved in doing it your own way. He would have provided for you either way. And that's where we need to examine ourselves to find if we're in the faith. Are you in the faith? Have you decided to follow Jesus? No turning back. Or do you really have most of your life in the world and almost none of your life in the kingdom of God? And I don't mean going to church. Going to church is a nice thing. Being in church is a nice thing. As a matter of fact, doing some volunteer work in a church is a nice thing. But nice doesn't cut it. Because if God didn't tell you to go to church, if God didn't tell you to get involved in church, if God didn't tell you to do something voluntarily at church, what are you doing? Are you being nice? And God says, who asked you? Because in that goats and sheeps that are presented before Jesus when they come to him, oh yeah, the goats come and say, hey, you know what? We did a lot of things for you, Lord. Man, you should have checked out my attendance. I was perfect at church. I did my Sunday school time. I wrote down and volunteered. I even paid my tithing. I gave you 10% so that we could pay the pastor and pay the church bills and pay the lights. Once in a while, I even kind of like, you know, decided to help the poor man on the street. Got news for you. You're going to hell. Why? Well, it's kind of a long story, but it's really a short story. So let's get to the short story and the crux of it. You know, the the nut, you know, that they say that's at the center of the fruit. You know, you cut away the fruit and what do you got in the center? A seed. And that seed is the Word of God. But did the Word of God inside you bear fruit? Did it actually produce in you love for your enemies? Well, no, of course not. I didn't love the gay guy. I mean, you know, forget him, man. He was like, you know, ew. Well, I didn't love the child molester. Ew. You know, I love the church. I love the brethren. Well, I'm glad for you. I'm happy for you. Jesus wants to know something from you. Did you do what he said? Well, yeah. Really? What about the Sermon on the Mount? Well, you didn't mean that, Lord. You didn't, you weren't serious, were you? I mean, after all, nobody could do that. Nobody could live that. Nobody could actually be that. 
He did. Peter did. John did. Paul did. Matter of fact, I think the first, second, and third century church did. I got news for you. The end of the world has come and it's time to pay the piper. It's time for you now to face the music. We're going to go into 2014 and you're either going to be totally deceived and all the way into the world or you're going to yank your body back out of the world and start getting right with God again, taking up your cross and following Jesus. Because you can go along saying, everything's fine, Michael. Calm down. Don't worry about it. Take it easy. We got it under control. You know, we got our house, man. Check it out. We got the mortgage paid. We got our job. Look at it. It's all going fine. And I even got storehouses that are full of food. Man, I am cruising. My kids are clothed. My wife is happy. I'm even going to church. I'm thrilled I got saved. And God gave me this. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? It's a simple question. It's not complicated. It's not hard. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. I'm not speaking a foreign language. I'm not inventing something that isn't already known in the Word of God. I'm not pretending that it hasn't been said before by preachers and teachers and pastors and prophets and Jesus himself. So, i, I got to ask you, do you know Jesus? Because if you don't know Jesus, grace has profited you nothing. Oh, you built a house, and I'm glad. And you built barns, and I'm glad. And you filled those barns, and I am glad. But you know, there was a magnificent temple built one day. And it was like the beauty of the world, the glory of the kingdoms of the world came to see this house that God had built, that God was in, that God was supposed to reside in at the time of Jesus. And they came to see this house and they were marveling at it. Even Jesus' disciples were caught up in the whole idea of the building as opposed to the purpose of the house of God. And when they looked at this house, they said, wow. And Jesus said, do you see this house? He says, not one stone will be left on top of it, but it'll be cast down and rolled over. He said something else interesting, too, to those that were living in that house. He said, destroy this house, and in three days I'll raise it again. And he spoke of his body, the Holy Spirit, residing inside of him, that he was the temple now of the Holy Spirit, and that we are supposed to be. And so it was kind of interesting that both were going to be destroyed. Both were going to be torn down. One was going to be raised again. The other would be rebuilt soon in our day, but it's going to be annihilated again, fortunately. It'll be there as a relic, but not as a reciprocal of or a reception of the Holy Spirit. It'll just be like a museum that we look at. Because the fact is the Holy Spirit is in us. Bottom line. That's all it is. There'll be some place that you'll take, or we'll say that the world will take the children of the world to and show them what the Holy of Holies is and what the demonstration of all the temple things were meant to be. And they'll see as the priesthood comes and performs for them three times a day, the show, you know, and you can see what the sacrifice is and what Jesus had done so that they would know what Jesus has accomplished. Because that's what it's going to do. It's going to be a museum. Now, it isn't going to be the temple of God. It isn't going to be the Holy Spirit because that's in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the bride of Christ. God has a purpose and a design for those few who are chosen. Are you one of them? Are you one of the people that God has chosen? Because, you see, salvation is easy to come unto. We all come unto Jesus so that we would receive salvation. And Jesus says, hey, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But I got a condition for you on that. It is grace. You are saved by grace and by grace are you saved and it will accomplish its purpose unto you for salvation. 
if you continue in my word. It's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Because we don't remember hearing that been said too often, do we? Or do we? You see, I was kind of reading today in today's devotional, and it says, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to be. I want to be blameless. God knows I'm not. I need mercy and grace every day to be saved. I need the salvation of God by the blood of the cross, by the word of our testimony, by loving up my life even unto death, that God would save me and spare me from the great tribulation, as well as present me faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. But I need God to do that. I need to be in relationship with Jesus in order for him to accomplish that. So it says, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Cool! If, oops! Whoa! Did you say if? If, whoa, what? Back up, Jack. Could you read that again? Okay, if you say so, it's Colossians, but you don't want to hear it. Sorry, I know, you know, it's like this sugar-coated grace and mercy is like, you know, cross with no cost. You know, I like the cross with no cost because it doesn't mean that you have to do anything, or do you? Well, you know, it says that to present your holy and unblameable and reprovable inside if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel the hope of the gospel the hope of the gospel that you may be blameless and harmless the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world it's interesting because you know I find people reading that scripture and they come to me and they say well we got to take a stand for righteousness I say Whose righteousness? Not Jesus's, because that's already accomplished. What kind of righteousness are you trying to take a stand for? A Christian nation? Well, yeah, we got to take back our nation. we got to take back the land. we got to lift up, we the people, standard of righteousness. Because, after all, we're a Christian, and we have to stand up for the Bible, for the Ten Commandments. Really? Who told you to? Well, the Bible does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. It doesn't tell you to stand up for righteousness. Does it? Because once you take a stand for righteousness and you stand up for righteousness, God will give you that righteousness. It's yours. You go take a stand on it. See how far it gets you. Not very far. Nine times out of ten, most of the stands that Christians take backfire on them. And it doesn't accomplish anything that God said to do in the first place. Which is the gospel. The hope of the gospel. Because you see, the hope of the gospel is salvation. The gospel is the good news that you can be forgiven, that you should be forgiven, that you should be presented before the Father with exceeding joy and with the righteousness of God, but not the righteousness of man. And yet we want to take a stand for righteousness. Oh, we got to fight those sinners. Oh, sinners. Whoa. Wait a minute. Sinners. You mean, am I fighting the wrong battle? You that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. How could you do wicked works unless you're wicked? And see if there be any wicked me in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Hmm. To present you holy and unblameable and unprovable. Yes, in his sight. Yes, if oh, you continue in the faith grounded and settled. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That you might be blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse, gender, a perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, sincere and without offense, till the day of Jesus. Now unto him that is able to keep you, or now him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. You know, it is interesting that we teach grace. I mean, I teach it. I have a 
ongoing Bible study called Video Grace. That it is a long theological study that's taking forever because we'll never finish it. But it's the interesting thing that in these modern age times that we live in, people have objectified grace as an accomplished purpose and a noun as opposed to an ongoing verb with which it is being given unto us so that it would accomplish in us the righteousness of God because the righteousness of God is an accomplished fact. That righteousness will be imputed to us on the day of Christ. But is it imputed to us now? And that's an interesting concept and question that theologians like to argue about. They like to debate, well, you're righteous now. Really? Am I? Are you sure about that? You're positive? I mean, I have full assurance that God forgives me. I have full assurance that God's going to present me false before the Father exceeding joy. But I have no doubt that I sin. I have no doubt that I've committed sin. I have no doubt that my sins are forgiven me. But I have a doubt whether or not that I'm always saved, because if I'm not saved, then I wasn't saved in the first place. So once saved, always saved? Yes, I believe in that. But were you saved? No. Not those that weren't saved. Well, wait a minute. You said you just believe once saved, always saved. Yeah, but who's saved? Who decides who's saved? Who gets to make that decision about who got grace and who didn't? Who got mercy and who didn't? Who got the loving kindness and who didn't? Who was the scepter extended to when Esther presented herself before the king? Because had she not had that scepter presented to her, she'd be dead. And yet, who has the scepter? Jesus. You see, the scepter would not depart out of Judah until the Messiah come. The scepter would not depart from the land of Israel until Moshiach come. And he rode in on the donkey on the day that was aforementioned that behold thy king cometh. He is lowly and meek, gentle, peaceable, the prince of peace, Emmanuel, God dwelling with us. He shall teach us the way of peace. So, all things have been committed unto him for one reason, because Jesus gets to decide who gets salvation. Jesus gets to decide who has salvation. Jesus gets to decide who is saved. And if we look at the parable as Jesus taught it to us and warned us, and he says, look, I'm telling you a fact, Jack. I'm the one. I am. And my Father and I are one. And God has committed all of this unto me. And I'm telling you, you need to know me, and you need to know him who sent me. That is eternal life. You don't know, you won't go. Why would you? Just because? No. So you see, the reality of what we've done sometimes with taking part of the Bible and not realizing that it's all the Bible, that the completeness of the volume of the Scripture is the heart of love that God has beating for us, that He would so love He would even give His Son, that should we reject the Son, God rejects us. Bottom line. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Anything you present before the Father is meaningless, purposeless, designless. Jesus himself will say, so. Because you can tell me about all your wonderful works and deeds and everything else, but if God hasn't done it, who cares? Who cares? I mean, I present a lot of things that I offer up to the Lord every day. Every day I'm working on something, and some things are accomplishing, and some things are wood, hay, and stubble, and the ones that are wood, hay, and stubble get burned up. The th things that are precious, God roasts it in a fire to see if it really can produce something good out of it. And then once he does test it and try it, if it's got love, joy, and peace in it, if it's going to accomplish something for his glory, wow, does it come forth shiny and bright. But are you tested? Have you been provoked? Are you loving your enemies? Are you deciding this day to follow Jesus? Or are you one of those who says you're a Christian, but you don't know if you're a Christian. You see, it's pretty easy to decide who is and who isn't from our perspective, not from the Lord's, because quite frankly, we don't know who is. But from our perspective, it's pretty easy. Be provoked. See what happens. Provoke yourself. Go out there and talk about President Obama for five minutes and see where your mouth goes. Go out there and talk about the gay community or the media or the government and see where your mouth goes. Because where your mouth goes is where your heart is. And where your heart is will determine whether or not you're a Christian. Because the fact of the matter is, if you put so much in your eyes that it has gone into your body and the darkness within you is nothing but darkness. Jesus said, how great is that darkness? And I came to bring light. 
And they that are of the light come to me to be revealed for what kind of person they are because they want to get the dark out of them. They don't want to have darkness, evil, hatreds, murders, envying, jealousy, strife, division. They don't want to stand up for righteousness. They want my righteousness, which is peaceable, gentle, kind, considerate, loving. No, there's no such a thing as a kind without love. Because love, or like and love, there's no such thing as a liking someone without loving them. Because if you think that's true, you've already dunked yourself in the world. Because that's philosophy. Philosophy 101. Well, you know, the love-like actions of a person, you know, because the external reactions of the particulates within a person can make it a determination that the long-term effect of love overwhelms the short-term effect of like within the circumstantial situational ethic of the more that's been dealing with in that person's interaction at the momentary time that they have. But once they have the time to consider it, they can get back to the reality of love. I don't think so. Jesus died, period. Don't tell me you like God or you love God and you don't like Him. Try that one on for size. The point of it is this. You have to know Jesus. You will always have to know Jesus. You have to know Jesus. You have to get so in love with Jesus that you're willing to sacrifice your job, your wife, your kids, your life, your everything for God's only thing that He gave for us, which is Jesus. You get to know Him by going after Him and pursuing Him. You get to ask Him and keep asking Him and keep pursuing Him until you know Him. Bottom line, you must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You must say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come to me. Oh, God, help me. Reveal yourself to me. Change me, whatever it takes, but make me to know Jesus. For without Jesus, I have no salvation. For without Jesus, I don't know what I'm doing. It's not about confession of sin only. It's not about making some profession of faith only. That's nice. But you know, there's lots of religions in the world that do the same thing. They confess their faults. They profess their faith. They do all the same things we do in Christianity. And they don't know anything about God at all. As a matter of fact, some of them do it better than Christians do. You can look at a evangelistic crusade and see how wonderful it is that thousands came forward. But follow those people for about six months. See where they're at in six months when that, according to Jesus, spirit is cast out of them. You know, and their house is nice and clean. They clean up their act. They got everything in order. You know, they look really good. Hey, you know, I got my life back. I've been saved. And then suddenly something doesn't go their way. And that demon comes back and attacks them. He brings seven that are worse than him and he comes and attacks them. And because they have not the Lord inside, their house comes crashing down and they are possessed and dispossessed of their salvation because they never had it in the first place. How dangerous it is in some ways for these huge revivals, these huge crusades we put out there. And we don't care about one person that might be that example of going to hell worse off than they would have had we had one person to live with for three years. Because i got news for you. Jesus didn't save thousands. Matter of fact, if you went to look at the ministry of Jesus in the way that He did it, He failed. He accomplished God's purpose, but He failed the ministry. Because modern ministry is about, whoa, we got to build churches. we got to get lots of people coming into church. Come to church, come to church, come to church. I mean, that's the mantra nowadays. We'll get you saved and come to church. Come to church, come to church. You'll be better, you'll be better. We'll make you feel better. We'll make you be better. You'll act better. You'll do better. You'll get better. Really? You really think everybody in church is that way? Or is it more like behind closed doors we find, guess who doesn't come to church anymore? The guy that popped his wife one. And guess what happened? They quit going to church. The church didn't come looking for them. Uh-huh. Maybe somebody in the church kind of wondered, you know, and maybe asked, but... Nope, man, you know, they're not coming anymore. We don't talk to them anymore. I kind of know what that's like. I don't hear so much from some of the people that used to talk to me, you know, because I even took a little mini vacation from church, you know, and <whistles> guess what? Zip of the lipa. Nobody shows on my door. And it's always a test to see where will you be when God says, did you do these things 
to visit me? Did you feed me? Did you clothe me? Did you take care of widows and orphans? Did you do what I told you to do? Because if you know Jesus, you do. If you don't know Jesus, you don't. That's the bottom line. By what you did and didn't do. Keith Green sang it one time. He made it very clear that the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the light. It's too busy just going, Ah, I like my bottle. I like my crib. I like my diapers changed. And they get what they want. As a matter of fact, the scariest thing in modern Christianity today is the church is getting in some ways what it wants. But it's not getting what God said to do. And that's what you and I need to look at today. So let's look at the Word and let's begin to examine our own lives. Because our lives are always patterned after the children of Israel. Because the children of Israel are the children of those that are governed by God. Israel, in one way of interpretation, means governed by God. Led by God, directed by God, taught by God. Israel really is governed by God. But do they act like it at times? No. So when Jacob was Jacob, God spoke to him as Jacob. And you can see that in Scripture. When God spoke to Israel, the man, then Israel, the man, was governed by God. And it was very obvious by what he was telling him and what they were doing. It's an interesting dichotomy to see that because that's kind of what a schizophrenic Christian is like and that's what you and I are usually. We're half the time led by the Spirit, half the time led by the world, and the other half of the time kind of playing flip a coin to see what God's will is because we don't want to do what God wants to do, but we do want to do what we want to do. So we're not only partly in the world and partly out of the world, but we're partly in our minds and out of our minds because we're not putting on the mind of Christ to only do those things that are pleasing in God's sight. Let's see what we ought to do. So, Father, I pray that this night, above all other nights, this day, above all other days as it's ending, this way, above all other ways, we would see Jesus today. We would hear you speak as we've already heard your word. And you've already warned us if, if, whoa, behold, and if. All these words that you said to pay attention, to grasp, to understand, to see, to hear, to often just simply be still and know that you're God. Help us, Lord, I pray, to see your word in the way that you prepared it for us, that you want us today to know you in a personal, intimate way, that we would not end the year one way and begin the year the same way, but rather we would look today to make a choice and a direction that we're either going to go on with you or we're going back to the world and its ways. Because God, it's better for us to eat, drink, and be merry and die than to participate half-heartedly and be cursed by God or spewed out of your mouth. God, I pray for these people that they would learn, they would listen, and they would hear. Even as I need to pay attention to what you're speaking to my heart. Am I all the way or am I out of the way? Put me in the way that you want me to go, and God, help us today to see the choices ours to make if we will listen to your voice. Praise the Lord. I like that. Now, I know you may have traded that as, Ooh, that was serious. Well, you know, God spoke to me, uh, I don't know, I was out... Um, Looking out, um, I was out walking in the parking lot. As a matter of fact, I was kind of like I, I got up, you know. I had, I think I had just finished recording a video um, about something. I don't know what it was. It was a couple weeks ago, and uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, "Get up, you know. You know, I'm gonna be out. You know, what do you want me to do? You know, go out?" And it's like I didn't hear a word. I went, "Oh, well, maybe I should go for a walk." So you know, I got up, you know, and that was about the only word I heard was "get up." You know, the rest I didn't hear until I got out. And it was funny because when I got outside, I started walking in the parking lot. And I was kind of like, yeah, that's kind of nice. You know, I guess it's nice out here. You know, it's kind of not warm, but it's nice. You know, it was warm, but it was not as cold as today. But, um, you know, it was warm. And I thought, well, Lord, you know, it's kind of nice to walk with you and talk with you. You know, sometimes you talk to me. Most of the time you talk to me in the bathtub. But, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, at least I get to kind of vent. You know, I said, you know, I should spend more time praying. You know, I kept thinking all these things I should do. Yeah, I should, you know, get serious about, you know, some of these things that religious Christians do that I don't do. You know, I mean, I do it when God tells me to, but I don't do it when, you know, other people do it. You know, like, people will pray over their meal every day. I don't pray over my meal every day. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I do. Most of the times I don't. But, you know, I mean, kind of like those things, you know, that are religious, dogmatic things that says, ooh, that's a Christian. You know, bumper sticker, you know. <laughs> but, uh, 
No, I was thinking about that, and I was walking along and thinking, you know, I really love the times, you know, and I was thinking about my wife, you know, and I've just, like, got a warm feeling and a warm fuzzy, because what I do when I'm with my wife in the morning is I take her to work, you know, about 4.30, something like that, early morning, take her to the train station, drop her off, and uh, on the way to the train station, I pray for her, you know, and she loves it, you know, which, that's why I keep doing it, because she loves it, you know, I mean, I would love to say I'm doing it because God said so, but, you know, not really. Although God did tell me the first time to pray, he hasn't told me since then to stop praying or to keep praying. He just said, pray for her, you know, and so I did that one time, and, you know, she didn't respond, you know, and I kept praying for her every time I took her to work, and the prayers kept changing. They weren't like, you know, all these superficial religious ones, you know, they were just like specific, you know, kind of like talking to you right now, you know, not just talking to God and saying what I really wanted for her, you know, it's kind of like, well, I want her to do this and that and, and have this and have that and really things about what came out of my heart. And, um, Blew her mind. Shocked, you know, and for about the first week, she didn't, you know, I didn't expect her to, but she didn't pray for me, and I didn't want her to, you know, because I frankly don't care if people pray for me. If I ask for prayer, I care, but, you know, other than that, I don't care. I got God, you know, I don't need your prayers, you know, but I'm glad people do when they do, because I really, I need your prayers, but bottom line is, um, I was just praying for her, you know, and sure enough, you know, it, it turned into where she started praying for me, and it was like, wow, you know, and then she got to where she's kind of like just praying different, changed, and completely changed. Changes her attitude, because you know, I know she's not a morning person. By the time she leaves this house, by the time she leaves my presence with God in between us, Jesus with her and Jesus in her, I know that she's ready for her day, and she's filled with joy. Did you hear me? She's filled with joy, and she enjoys her journey and her job. I know that, and that's a fact. Now, because I had done that, you know, I was out there talking to God about that, and I was saying, you know what, it's kind of neat the way that happened, you know, and then the Lord said, um, go back. I went, fine. <laughs> that's what I said to him, fine, because I was about halfway to the, through the parking lot, you know, towards the sidewalk. I turned around and went back, and God says, and then God spoke to me and says, you're the preacher. And I went, whoa. And it just hit me like a, well, you have to know the back story to know the front story, you know. And, but the, the, the full story is that in the Bible, there is the preacher, if you know your scriptures. And I was like, whoa. Because, you know, I, I've been on the Internet a long time. I write some things that, you know, most of the, most of the writings that I do, most of the commentary that I do is pretty, pretty wise, you know, I mean, it's God-inspired, you know, I pray about it, God gives me the words, and I write them down, you know, sometimes I have to tweak them, maybe, you know, most of the times, no, I don't tweak anything, it's like, hey, God gave it to me, so it's like, I don't care, whatever is supposed to happen, will happen, but being a writer and being a scribe, and I know I'm a scribe, because I have the talent, um, and there's a difference between, you know, a scribe isn't just about inscribing using calligraphy, but a scribe was someone who knew the law who's able to think according to the principles of legalities and contractualities and specifications and designations and all these things that really in Jewish culture was necessary for understanding the Word of God as well as understanding interpersonal communications and relationships. And so I had that kind of mind. I've, I've been born that way. I've had that mind all my life, but even before I was saved. So when, when God saved me, I was a scribe instructed unto the kingdom of God who brings forth out of his treasures things old and new, which by the time I got old, I could bring out those treasures. But when I was young, you know, it really wasn't so much so. So it was kind of interesting was that God, when he chose to use that word, the preacher, whoa, I transported myself 40 years backwards in time. It was back to an early days in the Jesus movement when I was at Calvary Costa Mesa. And um, I was reading in Solomon, the great prayer of Solomon, that just, wow, I mean, it was awesome. I mean, it was magnificent it was like way over the top and God heard it and honored it you know he wanted wisdom and he wanted to know how to instruct the people you know and stuff like that and I was dealing with people that were around me that were you know like awesome you know I mean people like Greg Laurie you know I mean they were, they were becoming awesome they weren't all awesome but he was becoming awesome you know and Greg Laurie, Mike McIntosh, Raul Reese, um, Chuck Missler had just come on, and he was teaching over Monday nights over at the hall, you know, and so you could go every Monday night and catch him. Romaine was teaching on Thursday, so you could go catch him. And I used to go to church seven days a week, and I used to um, volunteer at uh, Tape Landing Library, you know, on probably five days of those seven days a week, or six, I'm not sure. 
But, you know, then I'd quit the library long enough to go over to a study and catch it, you know, the ones I liked, and then come back, you know. And, you know, I got a chance to listen to, you know, if there was a dynamic new series that everybody was ranting and raving about, I might listen to the tapes, you know, because Firefighters for Christ was also, you know, giving us tapes that were bringing in. And so it was pretty cool in those days, you know. I was like, all inspired by everybody around me. They were like all these spiritual giants. Well, I had gifts of the spirit I didn't know they did some people didn't have. Maybe some of them do, maybe some of them don't. But I had some woo things going on in my life that I thought everybody would have, you know, and so I kept my mouth shut. And uh I found out later most people don't have those kind of things happening in their life. Okay. <laughs> woo <-hoo! laughs> Wow, what a ride. <laughs> Boy was that a learning experience. But Taking that uniqueness of that time in my life, you know, and and uh, you know, uh, the Lord's telling me to say something, and I don't want to say it. But okay, I was a virgin, you know, up until like I was twenty, whatever, you know, twenty one or two or three or something, you know. I don't remember exactly, twenty one maybe. But I was, you know, basically, you know, didn't have you know any intercourse, you know, at all, you know. So part of me was like, whoa, and part of me was like whoa, you know, I mean, part of me was like really holy unto the Lord, you know, it was really neat, and I had a lot of things happening that was unique unto God, you know, and I really think there's a big case for those Christians who choose to be virgins unto the Lord. I think, man, dude, you know, you got it. <laughs> you don't lose it, by the way, but you think you do at first, you know, until you find out. But then, you know, I was praying, you know, one night, and it was pretty interesting because I was there at Calvary, and I was thinking, man, if I could just be like these guys, you know, they all seem to know that God has told them to go. You know, I said, I, I, God hasn't spoken to me. What, what is his calling? I mean, here I'm reading, you know, and I'd read Through the Gates of Splendor, you know, and I knew all about, you know, um, Oregonian, you know, um, star that had given up his career, you know, in order to be a missionary. And, you know, he had gone on to a mission and died, you know, for the Aka Indians, you know, and he was like, you know, really a big deal. And Keith Green was running around singing songs at the time, and I was listening to him, and I was like, whoa, you know, this is what we're supposed to be. This is obvious what we should be. And I was watching Godspell, which, you know, really inspired me, you know. Then every, you know, Easter, of course, you know, we had on Jesus of Nazareth because it always played at Easter. And then during prime time, they even had Greatest Heroes of the Bible with that old guy, I can't think of his name. But anyways, you know, they would show these stories of the Bible. So it was a really pretty cool time, you know, that I lived in. And man, I was like brainwashed, thank God. But one of my prayers got answered and answered, answered, answered. Answered indubitably, <laughs> in, inevitably, <laughs> indomitably, you know, <laughs> inscrutably, you know, and he did answer it, you know. It's like, well, that sucks. Why couldn't you ignore that prayer? But I prayed to be like Solomon, you know. I was praying, you know, and I was looking at what Solomon did, you know, in his prayer. And I said, boy, Lord, I wish I was like Solomon. You know, I'd love to have all that wisdom, you know, to know why people won't follow Jesus. Or why do Catholics, you know, follow Catholicism when there's charismatic yeah, in, or charismatica in the charismatic movement that was going on at the time and Pope John, the little Pope that died, they murdered him or whatever, killed him off, you know, whatever. But um, he was there around at the time too, you know, so that, you know, there's kind of like, he was, you know, into the born again movement. But, um, you know, at the time it was kind of an interesting thing going on in the world. But, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, either heard my prayer and answered it or God did, you know, the Father or Jesus decided, huh, blow your mind, buddy, guess what, you asked for it, you got it. But uh, I did, I prayed, you know, and I kind of said, you know, Lord, I want to know. I do want to know. I want to know how come people don't get it. Why don't they understand? I mean, I was so in love and so innocent and so shiny. <laughs> oh, God, was I shiny in those days. Shiny. <laughs> Silent, but shiny. <laughs> I never said nothing in those days. You know, if something came out of my mouth. It was profound, you know, I mean, it was always this Holy Spirit speaking, it would be a word for somebody, but, you know, whew, never talking like I do now. But uh, I had no experience in life, none whatsoever. I mean, I was a virgin. What, 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 yeah, I, I basically, you know, raised in Norco, you know, I mean, I barely knew that, you know. Sure, I had to fight for my life at times, you know, being able to survive being a long hair in a short hair town. But other than that, you know, I mean, intellectually, yeah, I knew a lot, but, you know, I mean, Bottom line, it wasn't raised any religion, so, you know, this was all like, whoo, you know, open slate, you know, and God was just writing it on my heart, and then finally, God had to take it from my heart and make it applicable in my life by way of experiences, and I went the hard way. I called it the Solomon Road, and you can already figure out where that's going to take me, you know, and how that worked out for me. <laughs> wow. 
So yeah, you know, I mean, I wasn't a virgin long after that, but no, I'm kidding. But the point is this. I prayed Solomon's Prayer, you know, and I prayed it, you know, and it's like, yeah, I want wisdom, and you know, boom, boom, boom. And sure enough, I went from, you know, being a virgin, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, I lost my virginity not quickly, not long after that, about a year or two, you know, but my point is this. Not only did Solomon fail of what God told him to do, but Solomon purposely did what he was told not to do, and then at the end of his life still wrote the preacher and wrote the Ecclesiastes and wrote, you know, the Proverbs and wrote the things that he warned others not to do because he had done them. He knew what the truth was. He knew not to do what people were choosing to do. And he knew what the major sins, the minor sins, and all these other things that people are always debating about. He knew. I know because I know. <laughs> I did them. Yeah. Woo you know, like I tell people, one of the things I've always said about Proverbs, or about Proverbs, about Vidivo, um, in sharing and relating is we're always honest. We're always truthful. You know, I have no problem about being truthful because God saw everything I did. I took God with me in every sin I've ever committed. And I have sinned regularly, you know, and inconsistently or consistently or persistently or impersistently. How do you want to look at it? Yeah. But I tried to ruin grace, not on purpose, but I found out that grace was extended to me in such a way that it's up to God to decide, not any other person. Because you can't tell me that one person that makes one little sin and boom, he's not Oof. Of course, I don't know what's in his heart, but he's no longer with the Lord ever again and goes to hell. Is fair, it is, as me who's gone like, hey, you know, I know the Lord and I sinned and I dove into sin. And I like that stuff, but I dove in and enjoyed it. <laughs> Woohoo, man, what a ride. And found out the consequences of sin. And I didn't like it. And neither did Solomon at the end of his life because he saw what the consequences of sin was. And so when the Lord spoke to me, literally giving me you could say a calling I mean God had already called me into the ministry way back when when he spoke to me back in Calvary he told me that there was a place for you in my kingdom he didn't really elucidate on that until you know over the years gradually put me into places that he wanted me to do different things and experience different things in the church and in church secretary and sound man and sound engineer and evangelist and you know missionary at large and every time they couldn't figure out what to make me they'd make me a missionary at large and just you know go out and do and I'd go out and do you know but, you know, I've worked all the different offices like most Calvary people have or most other people have. And I went to other different churches to see what they were doing, to experience what they were learning and try to figure out what denominationalism was. And I learned it all, you know, and studied and expounded upon it, asked God about it. God would talk to me about it and tell me where they went off, when it started, how it started, where it started, how different directions it was going, where it went from one direction to another direction. And it was always interesting to me. I was, like, fascinated. I spent most of my life probably pretty boring to other people, but talking to God and God talking to me and studying what he was showing me. You know, I was like... I enjoyed it and experiencing a lot of things probably should not have experienced. But I experienced them, you know, and I learned life lessons from them and object lessons that I use in teaching. But all that is to bring about sharing with you as part of Vidivo Church the calling in the ministry that God gave me when we chose to change everything that we had done in Vidivo. My picture on Facebook to the icons to every little detail all the way down to the ground because what God was doing, he said to me a very interesting thing. He said, you're the preacher. Because I was getting so wrapped up in doing this video ministry that God wanted me to move into ministry in being <laughs> what my family says I am a pastor. I'm not, you know, but I because I know what a pastor means. Most pastors are pastors because what they're doing is they're actually setting themselves up as a preacher and they're just preaching and not teaching. Or they're not involved in the flock, really. But some are. You know, I got to give it to the local industry, the local pastor of a small congregation, maybe less than a hundred. You know, those I would say are pastors. If you're if you're a pastor over bigger, you're not a pastor. Let's get honest. You're a minister. You're an administrator. You may be a you know perfunctory CEO, but you know to put it bluntly, you're not a pastor. Because you know a, a, a shepherd doesn't sheep doesn't shepherd a flock of billions. You know, I mean. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. The only person who's pulling it off somewhat that I would say is possible, but he's an apostle, you know, is Rick Warren. Rick Warren really is an apostle. He's kind of like the upshot of what Chuck Smith was in the downshot. The upshot of Rick Warren is that he's out there that God is using in a big, dramatic way. And he has churches and everything else involved in knowing the Lord, following the Lord, and not following Him, and doing the things that God wants him to do, and encouraging them and exhorting him. 
the downshot of what Chuck did was that, hey, you know what our Lord's telling you to go, and he'd encourage you to go do, you know, and go be blessed, and let the Holy Spirit lead you. And it all, both, would accomplish in two different ways the same purpose, and accomplishes the same function. But other than that, I don't, and I mean everybody. I'm going to say John Corson, I'm going to say Rick Warren, I'm Rick Warren, I'm going to say John Corson, Greg Laurie, any of the other mega pastors, uh-uh, they ain't no pastor, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Not in my case, baby, because I know the word, it ain't, that ain't pastoring. That's an evangelist, Rick Warren, or Rick Warren. Greg Laurie is an evangelist. I mean, I love the man for an evangelist, but God knows he sucks as a pastor. No offense, Greg. I mean, Greg. Sorry, Greg. Don't get mad at me. Somebody will pass this on. I'll be like, get hate mail from <laughs> I won't get that even hate mail. The reason why I pick on Greg so much is because that's who I got saved with, so to speak. When I went forward to a quote-unquote message and then went in the back to be prayed for, it was Greg Laurie's message. <laughs> that little sucker. <laughs> I got hair. You don't. No, 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 no. But no, seriously, you know, I mean, it was, you know, early days for Greg, you know, and it was like, wow, you know, I got saved, 74. But um, when God spoke to me outside, it was like the preacher. And then I began to see as he, and he's done this a few times in my life, which is, if you've had visions and you know, you'll understand this. If you have never had a vision, you won't understand. My eyes are open, you know, God just went... And he opened up and I saw all before me, as it were, all of my writings, all of my, well, my early carnal writings also. Some of them were really done in the flesh more than the spirit. But, you know, all the spiritual writings and then all of Vidivo and all of Evotional. And I saw all of them, as it were, all at one time. And it was just opened up before me and I could see all of them. I could see the content, the intent, the portent, the fullness and the enveloping attitude of every single one of them, even when they were so gentle and so peaceable and so loving that they were like, wow, I couldn't have taught that. That was like the Lord. It was still preaching. It was preaching. I was the preacher. I was sharing the wisdom and the knowledge of a scribe that had been instructed in the kingdom of God and righteousness, but I was the preacher who had gone through those life experiences that got the scars to prove it, <laughs> spiritually too, that, yeah, like Solomon. And so, the end of 2013, the beginning of 2014, God called me into the ministry. I mean, God called me into the ministry of this ministry, the video church, the preacher. And so I found myself fascinated by what God was going to do. Because I went, oh, this is interesting. And then he began to open up the doors of how video church came about and how it's been brought to this place and how it was going to you know, take off where video ministry had already done. Because... In digital ministry, in internet ministry, it's easy to, quite frankly, have tens of thousands of people reading your material or watching your videos or participating in your website or looking at things that you've written or things that you have done. I know because I've done it. I had no money and I've always been freely received, freely give, so God has always given me that opportunity to be able to develop it whenever I got discouraged over the last well, about 10 years of of internet ministry, maybe 20 years, well, about longer anyways, 10 to 15 years of internet ministry, maybe 20, that whenever I got discouraged about this latter part when I finally went full-time into ministry that my wife and I determined, hey, you're going full-time, you know, I went, okay, you know, and we said, okay, you know, well, this is what's going to cost us, it's going to hurt, but, you know, we'll take it, you know, and so sure enough, you know, I'm full-time ministry, you know, and so for the last, I'll say, 10 years of full-time ministry, eight to 10, um, yeah, it was like, um, okay, now we see what you're trying to get at and where it's going. But in those days when I got discouraged during those eight years, God would you know, let me go ahead and kind of do something that Solomon did and David did that you're not supposed to do, you know, like number the children of Israel. I would check out the numbers. You know, I'd be able to you know, kind of go over to this one part of video ministry you know, and look at maybe the, uh, you know, the uh, Website, you know, this one website that I used to have that, you know, or I still have that is my, uh, it's kind of like my, uh, I'm trying to think of database, you know, it's like, oh God, it doesn't have everything I've ever done, but it has a lot of things from video. And, you know, when, one time we um, went after it and we got 22,000 people in one month, you know, and I was like, whoa, and that 22,000 people was on a blog. And at the same month that we did the 22,000 people in one month, I went into that archive and saw within five days over 50,000 people had hit that archive. And I went, oh God, I'll never look again. And I was, I, I actually backed out of the ministry. I actually took 
10 steps back and no steps forward, you know, because <laughs> I was humbled. I mean, I was shocked. I was in awe. I told my wife at the time, you know, and she knows, you know, it's still there so I could go check it if I needed to. <laughs> but um, no, I don't want to know. You know, I mean, it was like I stopped, I quit, I fasted, I prayed. I said, boy, Lord, this is, um, this is serious. This isn't like, you know, making things up. This is what the church has come to in the end of the age, you know. Greg Laurie doing his extended church, you know, with pastors in charge, of course, nearby, but still, the extended church. This is what the extended church is doing. This is what the mega churches are doing, putting up screens, you know, and broadcasting the words instead of worship from the heart. This is what they're doing. They're showing worship, you know, on a mega screen like the rock stars. They're showing the pastor with a mega star like a big giant screen person. They're showing this, and I kept complaining, and I kept complaining, and I kept complaining, and God said, do it. Oh, and I can't complain anymore. <laughs> Don't you hate that? You stick in your thumb and you pull out a plum. It's a bummer, really. Because you see, everything I was complaining about, God wanted them to do. Because God wants it to be that you, no matter where you are, how you are, what you are, in the condition you're in, even if you don't go to the church. Because frankly, most of the churches are pretty messed up. But if you don't go to church, you're still going to get church. Right where you're at. You'll get it on your iPad. You'll get it on your smartphone. You'll get it in your watch pretty soon here because the watch will even have it. You know, And my sites and everybody else's sites are all customized so that they can be condensed into that version. They'll just swipe it. You know, I get Sunday. Boom. Sunday. And there he is. Hey, Check it out. There, it, he's right there. Yeah, Dick Tracy, Kelly Gogo Gomez, and it's there. But you see, one of the things that I used to do was I was ahead of the church, so lots of times that's why I went after things and got things free and did all this internet ministry was because I was trying to inspire the church to do it too in Christendom. I'd say, Lord, make them like me and help them to get the word out. Don't just keep getting these devotionals and making books and keeping it to yourself and selling them at the church. Let's get it free out on the internet. So people can see it. Let's get it in their hands. If they want to give you money, go get your money. Fine. Go live by your money. I don't care, honey. But you know, I'm going to put it out there free like firefighters for Christ. So a lot of us that were from the early Jesus movement and that we learned the lessons that Keith Green was talking about before he went home to be with the Lord and the Lord said, hey, I can't leave Keith Green around. He might save the world. So we had to snatch him out of here, man. He would have saved a lot of people. <laughs> we don't know that. I'm just kidding. But the point is the music is still there. And you know what the words say. I don't know if the man was like that or not. I never met the man. But I do know the heart of the man. I remember he went out to Rain Cross Square in Riverside one time. But anyway, that's another story. Anyway, the long story short is that God spoke to me. God chose me. God called me. And so I'm not a pastor. I'm the preacher. And so that's what I do. I preach. <laughs> uh, I do know how to teach you. I mean... Information system specialist, you know, I've got all these career options that I've gone through in my life trying to figure out, you know, hey, I could do all these things. And I was like, <laughs> one of the biggest shocks I found in life and in Christianity was that you really can do all things well. Doesn't mean you can do all things perfectly, but you can do all things well. And that you really can get involved in a bunch of varieties of industries if you want to go out there and just do it. I did, and I'm not a genius. I tested an IQ one time that was pretty high, but, you know, who cares about that, you know, whether that day I was really on it because the next day that I checked it out it was like God wanted to humble me so I was like ignorant I can't be ignorant yesterday I was a genius <laughs> well you know you have good days and bad days but my point is this God called me God chose me I know Jesus you if you know Jesus you should do according to what God tells you to do whatsoever it is that the Lord tells you to do that you should do if God is with you then you hear his voice if God wants you to know him, he will reveal himself to you. God wants you to know him. He has always said so. He has always promised so. Now let's read in Joshua 24 what it is God would speak to you now. And it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and was stricken in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, and for their elders, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and said unto them, I'm old, and I am stricken in age. 
And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that has fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you by these nations that remain. No, behold, I have divided by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes. From Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight. And you shall possess their land as the Lord your God has promised unto you. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that you turn not aside, therefore, to the right hand or to the left that you come not among these nations, that these that remain among you neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as you have done unto this day so far. For the Lord has driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man has been able to stand before you unto this day. For the Lord has driven out before you one, of, one man of you would chase a thousand for the Lord your God. For one man of you shall chase a thousand for the Lord your God. He it is that fights for you as he has promised you. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Else if you do any work or in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations in any way, in any shape or form, even those that remain among you and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and they to you, know for certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. But they shall be snares. They shall be traps unto you. They shall be scourges in your sides. They will be thorns in your eyes. Until you have perished from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you, your days will not be of peace. And behold this day, I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing has failed of what God said he would do, what God has said he has done. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord God has given you. That was in verse 24, or chapter 24, but it was 23 to let you know America today. Just like the children of Israel. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. And so in verse 24, or chapter 24, we read, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old times, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father, Abraham, from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, or Canaan, and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. 
But Jacob and his children were down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them, and afterwards I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came unto the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea unto them, and covered them, and your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, or Balaam, the son of Baor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he pleased you still. He blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and I delivered them into your hand and I sent the hornet before you which drove them out before you even the two kings of the Amorites but not with any sword and not with any bow I drove them out with hornets and I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you built not. And you dwell in them, of the vineyards and the olive yards which you planted, not do you eat. That's interesting. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, and you dwell in them, of the and you dwell in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which you planted not, do you eat? Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served in the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were in the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, Oh, hey, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up out and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all our ways wherein we went, not among all the people through whom we passed and among from all the people whom we passed. And the people drove, boy, and the Lord drove out then before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Wherefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You can't. You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that he hath done you good. And the people spoke unto Joshua and said, No, no, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, he said, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice will we obey. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote down these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke unto us. 
It shall be therefore a witness unto us, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. The things that I've seen, the things that I've heard, the things that I've handled with my own hands regarding the Word of God, regarding life, I've chosen what I'm going to do. What are you going to do? You see, I've heard the words. I've seen what you said. I pay attention to everything that's posted on the Internet. I research even the people's life, the people's posts, the people's examples of what they portray themselves to be on the Internet. I know how much you're serving other gods. I know how much you say you're a Christian. I know how much you deny the fact that you have strange gods among you. The god of war, Marmuth. The god of violence, where you claim that you can take a gun and protect yourself by the rights and privileges you have in a land that is a strange land, a wicked land, a perverse nation. That you become just like the Romans of the Greeks that in centuries before did the same thing and acted in the same way. And Jesus warned you, they that live by the sword will die by the sword. Don't tell me like they told Joshua. You don't have strange gods among you. You do. You have a strange religion that can tell you that you can get away with what you're doing without there being a price to pay. You have a strange religion and a strange God if you think that the Lord God Almighty who is holy doesn't see everything you do behind closed doors, in bed, in sex, in deviant behavior, in perversions, in being literally that corrupted individual that you and I are. Because as much as the Christian will hide behind the marriage bed is undefiled, God is looking down and saying, oh yeah it is. I never intended for you to do and seek pleasure of what you are seeking to do to a woman, to a person, to the very image of God that I've created her to be. And look what you've done with her. And look what you've done to her. And look what you're doing about her and with her. And you call that holy? I know. I'm one of those. Choose you this day, Joshua said, but you are a witness of yourself. You are a testimony of your own sinfulness. You are an example of your own perversions, of the strange gods that live among your household, your home, your work, your play, your job. You have strange gods when you know more about your fantasy football team than you know about the Word of God. You have strange gods when you're more involved with, you know, the Christian school team than you are about knowing Jesus personally and you can't hear his voice. Does your family know how to find Jesus? Have you looked up and seen that the end of the world has come and now you're going to be held accountable for the lies that aren't prepared to meet Jesus in the air? Will you know what to do, where to go and how to be the day after the rapture when you don't go? Because that's the majority of the people I see. And it might include me. Because Paul tells us, and the Word of God declares to us, and God is speaking to us, that we pray to be counted worthy. Not that we are. The rapture is promised to no man. Let's be clear. The rapture is promised to no man. There is nothing in the Scripture that says the wrath of God could not be poured out upon the church. Nothing nothing. Because if you look at the letters to the seven churches, there are people that exist in the churches of Laodicea, of Smyrna, of Pergamos, of some of those churches that will be in great tribulation. The scripture that was applying was talking about the body of Christ. It was talking about the bride that was going to be removed from the earth. It wasn't about the church triumphant. The church that the gates of hell would not prevail against. The reason why the gates of hell will not prevail against the church is because the churches are going to go into the great tribulation period and all hell is going to come against the church. What's left of the remnant church. Those that are left behind. Those that get saved in the great tribulation period. And very few, it could be as few as one family that make it through the great tribulation. 
It doesn't say thousands get saved in the tribulation period and live. It says thousands upon thousands upon thousands go into great tribulation and die. God only needs one man and one woman to make it to the great tribulation period in order to fulfill the destiny of those that survived and go into the millennial kingdom and are not changed or transformed, but that are part of the rebellion in the end that is leading up to following Satan. For a thousand years, what could be accomplished in a thousand years? Oh, look at America. We haven't even been around that long. Have we? Maybe 2,000. It's close enough. We weren't much in the first thousand years of our existence. 17... What was it? We're 1776, so we've been around for 250 years. Let's see. Five times that from now, what would we be? We won't even be here. So you see, a thousand years is nothing when it comes to we look at our nation and think that we're something. We're not. We're absolutely not included in Scripture at all. There is nothing in the Word of God for America. But it talks all about Americans. It talks all about you and me. It talks all about what we should do and what we should be. Because Jesus has said that He would save us to the uttermost. God has said that He would take anyone that comes unto Him, that they that cry out, that call out, that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And let me give you some hope. You shall be saved. It might be in tribulation. You might die tomorrow by a car accident. Praise the Lord. If you die in faith, God has taken you home to be with Him. Praise the Lord. If you die by five years from now, well, let's say that's too far out. Two years from now, one year, one year from now, six months from now. Praise the Lord, you know. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. You'll be transported instantaneously into that day of the Lord when the dead in Christ shall rise. You may not understand that. We'll talk about that. But the point is this. What are you going to do today? Are you going to postpone decisions? Are you going to look around your house and say, Hey, you know, I kind of like my oldies, but goodies, you know. I'm still playing with my gods of men in the old days, the music that I like, you know. There's nothing wrong with that. Or is there? Well, I kind of like watching my porno, or, I, you know, I got grace. You know, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. I haven't, you know, like, gone out and committed adultery. You know, I'm not like those. You know, I haven't really done anything that bad. You know, I don't even, you know, really go to the beach, you know, or I do. And I don't really look at women or think about my neighbor or think about, you know, fantasize. I don't have a fantasy team of any kind, or do I? Don't tell me you don't have gods. You're lying. Because the first thing and the first step that you learn in salvation, and you learn in sanctification, both areas, the first thing you learn in salvation is you have to admit that you're a sinner. And the point of being is that that's not true, but the fact is is that that's what the law is teaching right now in Christendom, that you have to admit that you're a sinner. Well, you know, God already told you you're a sinner. Sorry, you don't have to admit it. It's fact. You are. You need salvation. But the person that's a sinner already knows that. And the nice thing about salvation is that the person knows that, so they they want out of that because they've suffered the consequences of it. But the problem in sanctification is that a person doesn't realize they're still a sinner and they need to be saved because they need to be saved from themselves. They need to be saved from self-deception, from the perception, from if you don't do these things like we just read in Colossians, to obey His Word, to do His will, to trust in the hope of the Gospel, then we really aren't saved, are we? We've chosen to take that salvation and cast it aside for castrating what God has done for what we are doing. And I'll tell you the bottom line on that. You'll get blessed because you will eat, drink, and be merry and go right into hell at the end of your life. Because it's all about knowing Jesus. And it's never been about your religious life. It's never been about the works that you've done. It's never been about how righteous you are or how holy you are. It's always been about that if you do works, you're doing them because God said so. Because you've talked to God, you worship God, you speak time, you spend time with God, you want God more than you want life itself. And if you're doing anything less than that, you already have your God. You've already made your idols. You've already accumulated all the things that you put in front of the living God. And you can't make it one way, one hope, one Lord, one God. Because you can't do the one thing that he said to do. 
deny yourself. Can you? Father, I pray, help me today. If it's about me, then God help me. If it's about my brother, my sister, anyone out there, help them. But God help us. You gave us a word called Hosanna, and it means save us now. And the children of Israel, when they were watching you come into the marketplace, when they were watching you come into the outer courts, when they watched you come into Jerusalem, when you came down that gate, they were crying out, not in great worship, but rather in great desperation to save us now. Now, admittedly, God, they wanted to be saved us now from Roman rule, save us now from the Pharisees, save us now from the Sadducees, save us from religious rule. Yes, they were crying out for that. That was obvious by what they said. Hoshana, Hoshana on the highest. Save us now. And so, God, I pray, Hosanna, Hoshana, Hosanna in the highest. Save us now. Save us from ourselves. Save us from our religious life. Save us from anything that would separate us from God. We have lived through this last year and proven we don't serve you because we've hated the people you died for. God, we have taken ducks and elevated them in worship and tried to make them our heroes, and they failed us. We have taken TV shows and tried to make them into gods and worship them, and they have left us empty. God, we have looked at all the different available internet sources and found ourselves confused and abused by the information we don't know how to use wisdom for. Help us. Save us from ourselves, O oh God, by giving us Jesus. Amen. Do you realize that? You are a product of your own choice. You did it. When you get to heaven, there will be no excuses. There will be no pardons. There will be no way out. You did it. You either did it in the sense of giving your life over to God and choosing to serve Him, or you did it because you chose not to. And it boils down to every day did you choose to serve the Lord your God today. Because the scripture doesn't say about tomorrow. It says today. It doesn't say what you did in the past because it's not about then. Because it won't last. It's about today. Choose you this day, Joshua said. In another place it says, Today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the propagation. Another place it says, Today is the day that the Lord has made. You can only live today. You can only be saved today, or you can only be condemned today. You can know that you're saved. It's a very simple way. It's a very powerful reassurance and assurance that the Word of God has given us this day to be confident in and to be competent of the Word that we would know that we're saved with the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and all the things that Paul tried to give kids playing in the sandbox, little tokens of appreciation of what God has done, which is all they really amount to. Because the fact of it is, if you are talking to God today, and God is talking to you, you're saved. That's it. Unless you're disobeying Him. It's always that possibility. Only a Jew would come up with that one. There's always, there's always alternatives, you know. Yeah, sure. But you can know you're saved simply because you know Jesus. If you know Jesus, then he who has the Son has life. He who is not the Son of God has not life. If you really are, like a lot of women can do better than men, have fallen in love with Jesus and you're willing to give everything for Him, and you have and you do every day, then you're in Him. And He's in you because He's talking to you. And you know if God is talking to you. Don't go there. You can pretend that you don't hear because you've stuck the you know iPods back in, you know the little earbuds, you know, and you said, I can't hear you. No, 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 no. I don't hear. I don't hear. I don't hear. So I'm not condemned. I'm not being challenged. God doesn't speak to me. Yeah. Because you don't want Him to. And that's what Joshua was warning the children of Israel. You will be driven into the land and wiped out of the land. And I got news for you about America. Same thing. You will lose your Christian dream 
your American dream, your we the people, your we the freedoms, your declaration of independence. How sad would it be to stand up there in heaven and try to hold that before God and say, hey, I got my declaration of independence and says that God says to you, good, now go to hell. Because that's where you can take your declaration of independence. Because if you're not dependent upon God, you are independent and you're going to hell. If your freedoms, you think you have freedom of religion, you don't. God never said you have freedom of religion. If you think you have freedom of choice, you don't. You've already made your choice. Everything in the Word of God, nowhere does it say you have freedom. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed, yes, but that's not the freedom that you think. It's a freedom to be living inside of that sovereignty of God that we are in relationship with Him. And we do things out of a choice of love, not because we have the choice to not love. Because if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. So don't think that you have freedom. It's not what you think it is, you independent, prideful person, when you assert your rights as though you have a bill of rights. You don't. You have an appreciation and you have a declaration to make. The appreciation is to say, thank God that you've given me the opportunity to be saved. And your declaration is to choose you this day whom you will serve. Because you're either serving the gods of men, or you're serving yourself, or you're serving the living God. And he will have no other gods before him, for he is a jealous God and he is holy. So choose you this day whom you will serve. I've made my choice. I made my absolute dedication. I look forward to the realization of it in this new year as we know we have barely a few years left. If we have three years, I'll be shocked. If we have five years, yeah, boy, that'd be like pushing it to the extreme. So I got news for you. You may be choosing for yourself, but as for me and my house, oh yeah, I'm working every day on every single person of this house and household to be saved. Because if you're not, be careful. You might see them in the Great Tribulation and you might find yourself on the other side of the rapture.